Hello everyone. In this second video on partial differential equations, we are going to talk about a few different topics. The first one is uh, categorizing uh, second order quasi-linear PDEs into, as I said, three subcategories, hyperbolic, parabolic, and elliptic, and then converting or transforming them into what we call their canonical forms which are the forms that are quite easier to solve, okay? So we are trying to transform these PDEs into a simpler form, into a new space, and in that space, the solution is easier. Then we're going to talk about solving PDEs using a Laplace transform and using Fourier transform, okay? So uh, let's get started. The first thing is... If you have a second order PDE, you clearly see the order of the derivatives with respect to any of the variables is not more than uh, two. A PDE is called quasi-linear if only the higher terms here, the second order terms, are linear. The lower order terms, which involves the first derivative in this case, the function itself and the uh, independent variables, they do not necessarily have to be linear terms. Okay, so if, if everything is linear, of course, we call it entirely linear, completely linear PDE. But if only the higher order terms are linear, then we call it quasi-linear. And then the uh, categorization of this quasi-linear into three categories can be done based on the coefficients of these higher order terms. If we call the coefficients of ux, x, ux, y, and u, y, y, a, 2b, please pay attention, this coefficient is 2b and c, then we form something like what we did for discriminant of a second order um, equation, right? Back in algebra, this is kind of similar, not of course exactly similar. Uh, but you see it's quite similar, right? Because if you square this, that's going to be 4b squared and then minus 4 times ac. And if you factor out 4, which is just a positive number, then you will get what? b squared minus ac, which is this guy here with a negative sign. Okay, so basically if you form the discriminant of this and factor out a negative 4, the remaining is this guy, which determines the type. Now, if this number here is negative, we call it hyperbolic. If it's zero, we call it parabolic. If it's positive, we call it elliptic. And the examples of them are wave, heat, and Laplace equation. I'm going to work through some of the numbers for these equations and show you. And why do we categorize them? Because the way that they are solved and the characteristics of their solution properties like smoothness and inside the domain, on the boundaries, and so on are different, okay? So let's say, for example, look at the wave equation. So for the wave equation, what you have is, if you remember, it was ut t minus c squared, correct? u x x if you remember that or it was equal to c squared u x x so you could write it like this where this coefficient is positive now here instead of variables x and y you have variables t and x that's that's the same thing no worries so if you want you can um replace y in this top format with what with t so if you want to rearrange it like that top one, you can write it like this. Negative c squared uxx. There is no uxt. So it is going to be plus 0 uxt, the mixed derivative. And UTT is 1, plus 1 times UTT equals 0. So the right-hand side function F is 0. So you can write it like that. And now, if I ask you, form that uh, discriminant for me, and uh, tell me whether it's positive, negative, or 0, what can you do? 
Okay, so let's do that. But uh, let me move this to the top. Okay, so as I said, you can write it that way. Good. So now comparing it with uh, what we have on the top, what are A, B, and C? A is this number negative C squared. 2B is 0. And uh, C coefficient is 1. So if I form A, C minus B squared, it is going to be negative constant C squared. Note that this C and that C are different things, okay? This C is the speed of the wave. If you might get confused, I can change this C to something else, okay? So that it is not confusing. So maybe to avoid confusion, I would call it, for example, whatever you want, V squared, where V is the magnitude of velocity, okay? So let's call it V squared. So that it is not confusing. So then you will have 1 times negative v squared. And b is already 0. So it is going to be negative v squared. And clearly it is negative. And we learn when it is negative, we call it what? We call it hyperbolic. So, yes, the wave equation is hyperbolic. Done. Correct? So, you clearly see why the wave equation, we call it hyperbolic. Now, let's look at a few other examples. The heat and Laplace. Let's look at them and then we go over um, transforming them. Okay? So, it's always a good idea to practice a few more problems. So it says now that the wave equation was hyperbolic, then it is talking about the heat equation and the um, Laplace equation. Okay, let's work on that. Just let me move this out of the way. There we go. So let's look at the... Um, heat equation, which was ut minus some constant. Again, this constant, I would call it something different, maybe w squared times uxx equals 0. And again, if you look here, other than uxx, there is no other second derivative. Okay, so even this utt is 0. So if you want to write this, you have to write it as negative w squared uxx plus 0 uxt plus 0 utt equals negative ut. And this is that f function that you had on the right hand side, okay, which is a linear function in this case. So now, clearly, again, you see that A is negative, B and C are what? Both zero. Therefore, when you plug it in here, you definitely get all of these equal to zero, correct? Yes, because 2B is zero, C is zero, only A is non-zero. So clearly from here, AC um, minus B squared is going to be zero and so the heat equation is parabolic and finally the laplace equation now the laplace equation is something like uxx plus uyy equals zero right and you can add if you want one extra term which is zero plus 0 times uxy, correct? There is no mixed derivative, equals 0. So the right-hand side f function is 0. And if you look at the uh, coefficients, so here this is 1 times that, so that is your a. Your 2b is 0, and your c is also 1. So clearly, again, ac minus b squared is going to be 1 times 1 minus 0 squared, so it's going to be 1, and it's positive. 
and positive means it is what? It is elliptic. Okay, so that's the categorization of these three equations we have mentioned in the previous uh, lecture, wave, heat, and Laplace equations, where they are used in engineering a lot. Okay, so this is the categorization of them. Fine. Now, what's the importance of this? The importance is this. The importance is each one of these categories of PDEs can be converted into what we call their canonical or normal form by a transformation. So instead of, let's say, if the independent variables in the original equation are x and y, now we come up with two new functions, uh, phi of x and y and psi of x and y. And then either phi and psi or a combination of them is used to now convert your um, PDE, which was defined over x and y, to now being defined over this v and w, which, as I said, are these phi and psi functions. We call them characteristic function of that PDE. And now in this u, uh, vw space, the form of the PDE is quite easier to solve. Okay, so again, this u that was a function of x and y, we transform it into a u, which is a function of what? v and w. And instead of the more complicated format that it can have in this space, now in this vw space, by change of variables, the format is way easier to solve. So it will either be something like this Laplace version there, or it is going to be something like only a second derivative with respect to one variable there, or it is going to be the mixed variable there. Okay, and these are quite simpler to solve compared to this general format, which it can have the mixed derivative and both the second derivatives. Because when you have mix plus the second derivatives, in many cases, it's not easy to do separation of variables. Okay? When you do separation of variables, you rather have only functions, derivatives of x or y. If you have mix, this term will not allow you to do the separation of variable easily. You cannot separate. But if you get rid of this, or get rid of those two, so you only have one of them, either the mix or the two second derivatives, which we call here the canonical form, then here you can apply the separation of variables. Okay, so you can say this u of v and w can now be written as some function of v plus some function of w. But here you could not easily say it is some function of x times some function of y because you have all three derivatives, higher derivatives there. Okay, so this converting into canonical form allows for us to analytically solve one of the, these PDEs. Now, how do we do that? As I said, how do we find this V and W? This V and W are functions of X and Y. So V is a function of X and Y and W is a function of X and Y. And then using these relations, I can change my derivatives that I had in the original equation in terms of x and y. I can change them to be in terms of what? V and w. So again, using these two relations, I can convert my relations that were partial derivatives with respect to x and y, correct? Stuff like that, let's say. or um, this, or this, I can convert these guys into what? Convert them into partial derivatives with respect to V, mixed derivative with V and W, and make uh, second derivative with respect to W. 
So I'm going to transform my derivatives from xy space to vw space. And so my ODE, my PDE, will be written in terms of v and w, which is going to be way simpler. We call it canonical form. And in this canonical form, I can do separation of variables. Now, how do I find this v and w? So here in this table, you see that v and w are given in terms of these two functions, phi and psi of x and y, which are just constant numbers. We call them characteristic functions of the original um, PDE. And how do we find these characteristics? These are the solution. These are the solution to an ODE like this, ay prime squared minus 2by prime plus c equal 0. So it is kind of, if you look at these coefficients, they are kind of similar to what? Similar to these guys. Except this is positive 2b, this is negative 2b, but... Uh, these coefficients are similar to that, and it is a quadratic equation in terms of y prime. So a y prime squared minus 2b y prime plus c equals 0. From here, if you can find y prime and then y as a function of x, and since it's quadratic, you're going to have two solutions, then you are going to write these two solutions into one of them to be phi of x and y constant, the other one to be what? Psi of x and y constant, okay? So, in order to do this transformation, you need to solve this uh, quadratic nonlinear ODE, find the two solution functions, call one of them which you can write it as phi of x and y constant, and the other one you can write it as psi x and y constant. You call these characteristics, and then using those characteristics, you can uh, transform your original PDE into these canonical forms for which the solution is easier. And not only easier, sometimes it makes it possible because uh, sometimes the ODEs are written such that uh, the PDEs are written in a way that you cannot, for example, use separation of variables. So let me demonstrate that with an example. So let's say I have a, a PDE like this, which is UXX plus UXY minus UYY equals zero. If I ask you to solve this with separation of variables, what you need to do is assume that this u of x and y is a function of x times a function of y. And if you plug it into that top PDE, if I use uh, prime for one derivative and uh, since here are both of them are x and y i cannot use dots dot is used for t so if i want to write it then i have to write it something like this uh, second derivative of f with respect to x so if i just call it fxx now pay attention that this xx is not partial derivative it's just direct derivative because f is only a function of what x times g, so this is not really partial derivative. And then if you don't like that notation, I can write it as this. And then plus d uh, squared of, and, um, or not actually, it has to be written as df over dx times dg over dy and minus uh, f times second derivative of y, g with respect to y. This is zero, okay? So that's if we replace it. And now, 
can I separate this into two um, separate functions, one out of x, one out of y, and say since these two functions of x and y are equal, then the only solution is they are both equal to a constant. You know, you cannot do that here. Right, because last time this middle term did not exist when we solved for the wave equation, and we we took this last term to the right hand side, divide both sides by f times g. So this time becomes second derivative of f with respect to x divided by f. This term becomes second derivative of g with respect to y divided by y. So that was only x function. This is only y function. The only solution is they are equal to a constant. Now here, if we divide by f and g, this middle term will be a function of both x and y. And this middle term will not allow us to do uh, separation of variable. It's not possible. Now, if we want to solve it still analytically, we come and try to first find what type of these equations this guy is then try to solve this uh, ODE for the two characteristic functions, phi and psi, use one of them or the other one or a combination of them as V and W and then transform everything from X and Y space into what? Into V and W space. So the goal is to transform this into one of these canonical forms where you can do separation of variables. If you look here, definitely you can do separation of variables because either the double derivatives pure uh, v and pure w exist or if the mix exists the other two does not they do not exist when all of them together exist you cannot do separation of variable but if only the first and third term or the second term exists at, at one time then you can do separation of variables okay or you can simply do simple integration for the first one i'll show you so what you need to do here is this coefficient a for us here is 1. The coefficient 2b is also 1. And the coefficient c here clearly is negative 1, right? So if I form that kind of discriminant, which was ac minus b squared, it is going to be 1 times negative 1. Correct, and then times a minus, and b here, 2b is 1, so b is 1 half, so this is going to be this guy squared, and clearly this is going to be negative 5 over 4, which is negative, and negative means elliptic, uh, sorry, uh, hyperbolic. It is hyperbolic. And for hyperbolic, I can directly use those characteristics. I'm going to find phi and psi, one of them to be v, the other one to be w. But first, I need to solve this uh, quadratic ODE, where a y prime and a is 1, so it is going to be 1 y prime squared, minus 2b, so minus of that number, times y prime, and then plus c, which is also negative 1, correct? Plus c, and c is negative 1, is equal to 0. So this is what I need to solve. Now, this is a quadratic equation. The first thing I can do is solve it, just considering y prime to be any variable. Solve for the two solutions of y prime, which is clearly negative b plus and minus b squared and um, minus 4 times a times c divided by 2a. Correct? And uh, a is 1. Good. So if I simplify this a little bit, y prime is going to be 1 plus and minus, this is a square root 5, divided by 2. So y prime is either 1 plus a square root 5 times 2 or 1 minus a square root 5 times 2. 
So let me write them down. Y prime, which is dy over dx, is either 1 plus the square root 5 over 2, or it is 1 minus square root 5 over 2. And if you solve this, uh, clearly when y prime is constant, y is going to be a linear function of x. So this is one of the solutions. And this is the other one of the solutions. And now if you bring the x term to the left hand side, you will get what? You will get y minus this number times x equal constant and y minus the other number times x is the other constant. And clearly now you see this is a function of x and y equal to a constant. So this is your phi function. And this is another function of x and y equal constant. So this is your psi function. So these are the two functions you need for, these are the characteristic functions. And per this table, you can use one of them for hyperbolic to be phi, phi b v variable, and the other one to be w variable. So now I say this is equal to v. And this is equal to W. So V is Y minus 1 plus the square root 5 over 2X. W is Y minus 1 minus the square root 5 over 2 times X. So I found my transformations. V as a function of X and Y. And W as a function of X and Y. Okay. So now what? Now that I found these transformations I need... I have to rewrite my original PDE and convert it from XY space into derivatives of V and W space. And in the VW space, it is going to be simpler and you can apply the separation of variables. How? Well, let me show you. So, for example, if I have partial of U with respect to X, correct? How can I write this? Well, note that uh, x here is a function of v and w, right? Because v and w are function of x and y. If you find the inverse of them, you can say that x is a function of v and w and y is a function of v and w. So if you want to calculate this, what you can do is you can apply the chain rule. So this is going to be partial of u with respect to v times partial of v with respect to x plus partial of u with respect to w times partial of w with respect to x. Correct? So you can write it this way. Now, these partials of u with respect to v and w, let's keep them. What is partial of v with respect to x? Well, clearly from this top one, you can find the partial of v with respect to x. What is it? It is this negative coefficient. And if you ever need partial of v with respect to y, clearly it's 1. Similarly, from the bottom one, you can find partials of W with respect to X and Y. So this is that negative 1 minus the square root 5 over 2. And partial of W with respect to Y is still 1. So now I can plug those info here. So this one is, and this one, this is... Uh, minus 1 plus square root 5 over 2. And this is minus 1 minus square root 5 over 2. So you see now, wherever in your original um, 
ODE, you have a first x-derivative, you can replace it based on the first derivatives in terms of V and W. But the thing is, I do not have a first derivative with respect to x. I have second derivative with respect to x, and x, y, and y, y. But first, let's get these guys because we need them. Okay, so uh, let me bring it down a little bit. And what is partial of uh, u with respect to y? Well, I can do a similar chain rule and say this is partial of u with respect to v times partial of v with respect to y plus partial of u with respect to w times partial of uh, w with respect to y. Correct? And... Again, these guys here, this is 1 and this is 1. Okay, so you see now my partials of u with respect to x and y can be replaced with partials of u with respect to v and w in these two equations. But again, I don't have first derivatives. I only have what? Second derivatives of x and y. So now the question is, what is second derivative of u with respect to x? Well, definition of that is the derivative of u with respect to x, the derivative of that with respect to x, correct? That's the definition. And again, instead of taking the derivative of this guy, whatever it is with respect to x, since x is a function of v and w, I can say, I take the derivative of that with respect to what? With respect to v and multiply it by derivative of v with respect to x plus I take the partial of that with respect to w times the derivative of w with respect to x. So I'm applying this chain rule over and over and over. Okay? So now what goes inside? This guy here, this uh, partial of u with respect to x goes here. You see? And now what is partial of u with respect to x? Well, I have it already on the top. So this relation, whatever it is, I can replace it down in here and in here. And these partials of v with respect to x and v w with respect to x, again, I have them from the top. So this is this uh, negative of 1 square root 5 over 2, and this is that negative of 1 minus square root 5 over 2. Okay, so if I simplify, what do I get? So it is going to be partial of V of whatever I have up there, negative 1 plus square root 5 over 2 partial of U with respect to V and uh, minus 1 minus square root 5 over 2 partial of u with respect to w. Okay, so far it's just this first term, times negative 1 plus square root 5 over 2, and then partial of w of, again, the very same thing, right, so it's this guy, times partial of W with respect to X, which is this one.
if I apply this negative one to it, it is going to be like that. So I multiply the negative one here. And now, uh, let's make sure we have not made any mistake. Yes, we did something here. This is, this negative should be applied to both of them. So if you want to write it like this, then it has to be both negatives. Okay, or you can write it like this. as you had it up there. So you have to be very careful with negatives. You make the smallest mistake. That's enough to ruin all of your calculations. Okay, this is good now. And now we have to simplify that. Okay, so here you have partial of V, partial of V, so it's going to be double partial V. So it is going to be negative 1 plus square root 5 over 2. Uh, second partial of U with respect to V squared. Then you have VW, correct? So this is going to be minus 1 minus the square root 5 over 2, second partial derivative of u with respect to v and w. This whole thing times that negative of 1 plus the square root 5 over 2. Now we go to second term. So let's say plus and bring this guy down. Here, you are going to have negative of 1 plus square root 5 over 2, partial w, partial v, so it's going to be second partial w, v. Then you have w, w, so it is going to be w squared, and then the whole thing times this. Okay, and you have to simplify here. So the v squared term, uh, derivative of u with respect to v squared, the coefficient of it is this number time itself squared. So it is going to be 1 plus square root 5 over 2, the whole thing is squared, times partial of u with respect to v squared. Okay. If you look at VW term, the mixed term, you have what in it? You have negative and negative. Those two negatives would go away. So it is going to be 1 plus square root 5 over 2 times 1 minus square root 5, 2. In the top one, in the bottom one, again, the negatives would cancel out. So you have a negative here, a negative there. They would go away. And... Um, Again, these terms will be multiplied. Okay, so it's going to be two of that. It is going to be two of the product of these two. And the product of these two uh, is going to be uh, minus two times one minus five divided by four times partial of u with respect to vw. And finally, you have w squared 
where again the negatives can go away. And it is going to be plus 1 minus square root 5 over 2, the whole thing is squared. As you can see, um, times partial of u with respect to w squared. Okay, so this thing here, down here, I can make it a little bit smaller. This is the second partial derivative of u with respect to x squared. And this is what you need to replace in your um, original PDE. You have to do something similar for the partial of u with respect to y squared and the mix u, x, y, and write them again in terms of v and w. And when you plug everything back into your um, original one, when you do that, then your equation is going to be, so I'm not going to do all of that because it takes a lot of time, but it's a very good practice for your uh, chain rule and partial derivatives. If you do all of that and plug everything back, then the result is going to be simply u of uh, v and w is f1. And what is f1? It's this right-hand side equation, a transform version of that. But in our case, here, on the right-hand side, I have nothing. I don't have any x, any y, any ux, any uy, right? And the u itself. So for my case, because my right-hand side is 0, the PD is homogeneous, this f1 will also turn out to be 0. So when I do all of that, my final thing this one that I could not solve will be converted to, you have to do all of those algebra, all of those derivatives. At the end of the day, your PDE will be turned into U of derivative V, derivative W equals zero. Okay, which is amazing. Because now we can easily solve this. What kind of function do you have that if you take mixed derivative of that is zero? You can easily show that it should be something like what? Like any arbitrary function of v, whatever you want to call it, plus any arbitrary function of w. If you take partial, mixed partial of this with respect to V and W, clearly, this is V, not U, clearly the answer is going to be zero. So this is the general format solution. Done. Okay. Now, what are these functions exactly if I want to solve them uniquely? Well, you have to look at your boundary conditions and uh, initial conditions. That satisfies this solution. But in general, uh, this is the general solution here, just like that. Okay? So, uh, as I said, you have to do a ton of algebra. You have to find a similar relation that here we found for double derivative of u with respect to x. You have to find a similar one for double derivative of u with respect to y, and then the mixed derivative of u with respect to x, y. Write all of them in terms of u, in terms of v and w, replace them back into the original PDE. Once you do all of that, your original PDE that you could not do by separation of variable now can be reduced into this form that easily is solvable as a simple general solution. Okay, so uh, it's not just to make it simpler. The thing is, this canonical forms you can easily solve them, or it's possible to solve them, while not every quasi-linear PDE in this format can be solved by separation of variables. So as you can see here, 
when you want to solve PDEs analytically, you have to go through a huge effort. And the fact is, these solutions only exist for some of these PDEs, okay, that are linear, quasi-linear, and stuff like that. Once they get nonlinear, there is no general solution, analytic solution. I mean, numerically, as I told you, you can use finite element, finite difference, and finite volume. And in my next video, I'm going to talk about finite um, uh, difference method. But uh, in general, solving PDEs is way harder than ODEs. And when they get into the nonlinear realm, almost forget it. You, there's almost zero thing you can do to solve them analytically. In the linear realm, there are some areas where you can replace a variable or do separation of variables. If uh, they are not directly solvable by separation of variables, you have to, uh, but they are like uh, hyperbolic, parabolic, elliptic, quasi-linear PDEs, second order. You can do these transformations and convert them into canonical forms that you can solve. Okay, so again, you see the solution is quite cumbersome. It's not easy. But I need to tell you this important information. Now, let me show you two other methods of solving PDEs. So, so far we have only seen change of variable, separation of variables, and uh, converting into forms that you can do separation of variables. Now, one way of solving linear PDEs, I have to mention that here for you, linear PDEs can also be solved by the Laplace transform. Yes, the same Laplace transform that you solve ODEs with. Now, you can use it and convert your um, PDE as long as it's two variables. You can get rid of one of those variables if it's time, for example, and... Uh, Convert it into an ordinary differential equation that now we can solve. So one important thing is it has to be really the time variable because Laplace transform is defined for time. But if you change your variable from time to something else, you still can apply it. Now, uh, let me tell you something with an example instead of just talking about general stuff. Let's look at one example that we already solved. And if you remember, that was the wave equation. What was the wave equation? The wave equation was this. The wave equation was UTT, right, minus C squared UXX was equal to zero. And we wanted to solve this. And let's say we had these boundary conditions. If you remember, we had like boundary conditions like U at location zero and any time point is zero. U at location L at any time point is zero. So we fix the two end of the uh, string. And initial conditions were like um, at time zero, we gave this overall string some initial shape, initial deformation, whatever it is, f of x. And we also had some initial uh, velocity. Let me say that is zero. So we released the string from rest. So ut of x at time zero was also zero. Okay, so this was the problem we solved, if you remember. Now, can you solve this problem using Laplace transform? Well, what was Laplace transform, if you remember? Laplace of f of t, which we showed by cap f of s, was the integral from 0 to infinity of f of t e to the negative st dt. Correct? Now, can I apply that to this u function? So now, what is Laplace of u of x and t? Well, it only work on t. It's not going to do anything on x. So I can write it as u of x and s. And this is the integral from 0 to infinity of u of x and t. 
e to the negative st dt. Okay? So we are going to use this transformation. And from the space of x and t, I'm going to take it into the space of x and x. And over there, my original PDE, this guy, will be written way simpler. I can convert it into an ODE. Really? Yes, I'll show you. So this is quite an interesting thing, this Laplace transform. As long as you can apply it to a PDE with, let's say, two variables and one of them is time, it is quite interesting. Okay, well, let's do it. So if I apply Laplace to my equation, so what is Laplace of this? What do you get? So, you know, Laplace only applies to the t terms. So, this is Laplace of second derivative, time derivative. And if you remember from Laplace transform, this is going to be what? This is going to be s squared u of uh, x and s minus s times the small u function at what? At... Um, x and 0 and uh, minus u time derivative of x at time 0. Correct? This is what we had from Laplace transform. These are the two initial conditions. Now, on x, it's not going to affect anything. So the second derivative of u, when you apply Laplace to it, the Laplace and the derivatives of x can easily come out. So, uh, what do I mean by that? Let me show you. What is the Laplace of uxx? This is the Laplace of, or you can write it as, the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st, and for u x x is the second partial of u with respect to x, dt. Now note that here inside the integral everything is with respect to t, this derivative is with respect to x, so I can bring this uh, double derivative x out of the uh, integral, and I can write it like this. And this is that Laplace of u, so it is going to be second partial with respect to x of u of um, x and s. Okay, so there is nothing else. This x derivative and the Laplace transform are separate things. One of them is in the x domain, one of them is in t domain. They are not going to interact with each other. So this is going to be minus c squared and uh, second partial of cap u of x and s with respect to x squared. This is 0. Now let's plug in these uh, conditions here. What is u of x and 0? Clearly you see that's f of x. And what is the u dot at x and 0? That's 0. So now, if you look and simplify, what would you get? Here is a function of s and x. This is s and x. This is s, and this is also uh, u. So if you rearrange it, you can write it like this. That... Um, second partial of cap u of x and s over x squared, right, times negative c squared, plus s squared times u of x and s, and then uh, minus s times f of x is equal to 0. And guess what? This is a this is an ordinary differential equation because s here uh, 
there is no s derivative here s is just a parameter an algebraic parameter here and uh, I should be able to solve this because here u only has x derivative so instead of partial right because s does not have derivative I can change this to what exact derivative single derivative so this is going to be like this d squared Okay, if I remove this notation x and s, then you clearly see I can write it uh, like this negative c squared, second derivative of u with respect to x, plus s, s again, consider it like a constant here, s squared times u minus s times f of x equals 0. Again, s treated like a constant number. It does not have anything to do with x. So it's a constant number, it's a constant number. This is clearly a second order what? This is clearly a second order linear ODE with constant coefficients. If you look at the coefficients, the coefficients are all constant. It's just not homogeneous because this f of x, you can take it to the right hand side. So if you want, you can write it like this. And clearly, this is a non homogeneous second order linear ODE with constant coefficients. And you know how to solve this, right? Don't you? So it has a. Um, homogeneous solution and it has a particular solution which does depend on f of x correct so you can say this u is a u homogeneous plus a u particular u homogeneous comes from the characteristic the auxiliary equation for the left hand side particular comes from this guy correct so the homogeneous is, for example, what? If you want the homogeneous, the homogeneous is going to be what? For that, you have to form the auxiliary equation, and that was negative c squared r squared plus s squared times r equal, or plus s squared is equal to zero. There is no first derivative of u with respect to x. This is just u. And clearly, you know, the solution here is R equals what? Plus and minus um, S over C. Yes? So your U of H is clearly going to be of general format A, E to the uh, positive S over C times X plus b e to the negative s over c times x. That's your uh, particular sol uh, homogeneous solution. And again, the particular solution, it does depend on this uh, f of x. Again, s, you consider it like a constant number. So if you have any function here, then you can have the particular solution, right? So, for example, if you want to go with what we had last time, remember last time I used something like Lx minus x squared, which is a polynomial. And, you know, when the right-hand side is a polynomial, the form of the particular solution will also be a polynomial, right? It will be a polynomial of the very same order, correct? And then... Uh, depending on the roots of this characteristic equation, whether any of them is zero or not, you might have an extra term to multiply to that. Now, in this case, there is no root of this uh, uh, auxiliary equation that is equal to zero. Therefore, uh, there is no extra term needed. So if I go with that f of x, then I can say that this particular solution u of p is going to be something similar. So if I treat s as a constant, this is going to be slx 
minus Sx squared. Again, S is a constant and L is a constant. Again, this is quadratic, so my general format is going to be quadratic. So it is going to be something like um, d plus ex plus fx squared. Where in order to find d, e, and f, I have to plug this up into my... Uh, original ODE and then from there I can find the coefficients D, E and F based on these other coefficients. Right? So for example if I plug it in I, my um, second derivative of UP with respect to X is only going to be the 2F term and you have to multiply it by negative c squared. So it is going to be negative c squared times 2f. That's the first term. And then plus s squared times the whole thing. This should be equivalent to what? slx minus uh, sx squared. And plus zero constant, of course. And so now, if you rearrange the left hand side, it has the uh, x squared term in it. Let me rearrange it and write it properly. So it is going to be s squared times f times x squared. And the uh, linear term is going to be plus s squared e times x, and my constant term is going to be s squared d minus 2fc squared. This should be equivalent to, as I said, negative sx squared plus slx plus zero constant. And now from the equivalency of these two quadratic terms, I can find d, e, and f. Clearly, if you look, the coefficient of x squared in both sides has to be the same. And from there, uh, f clearly has to be negative uh, 1 over s. Correct? If you look at e, the term for the x, they both share s. So s goes away, and so e has to be l over s. And if you look at the constant terms, then with what we had for f, if I replace it, then d has to be what? It has to be uh, negative 2c squared over s divided by another s squared. So this is going to be negative 2c divided by s cubed. And so your particular solution up is going to be, if I plug this d, e, and f back into what I had, it's going to be negative 2c over s cubed plus l over s correct, times x, and plus negative 1 over s, the whole thing is squared, times, uh, or no, not the squared, this negative 1 over s times x is squared. So that's your particular solution, and now if I have this particular solution, and I have this homogeneous solution. Add them together, right? So if I call this equation 2, that's the homogeneous. If I call this 3, which is the particular, and plug them back into 1, I will get my total solution, correct? So 2 and 3. 
into one your u of x and s is going to be a times a to the s over cx correct plus b times e to the negative s over cx and plus whatever i have up over there minus one over s x squared plus l over s x and minus two c over s cubed that is my um, solution in the x and s space now if i apply a uh, an inverse laplace transform it's going to go back to the um, x and t space and then i can find a and b over there or i might be able to apply a and b right here then go back so so far i have only applied what i have only applied my uh, initial conditions what about boundary conditions it says u of zero and tu of l and t are zero can i apply a laplace to these guys if i apply a laplace to these laplace of u of x and uh, zero and t this is going to be u of uh, remember laplace is not going to affect x so it is going to be x and then for x you're going to plug in zero so it is going to be like that and if you apply a similar thing to the bottom one you are going to get u of l and s is equal to zero so now I can apply these two guys, if I call them 4, I can apply this 4 into that overall solution I had and find those constants A and B. So I go back here and I say U of zero and S if you plug in zero for x, these are both going to be one. So there's going to be a plus b and wherever else you have x, it's going to go to zero. So they're going to go away. So this has to be zero. And also u of l and s, which is going to be a to the exponential s l over c plus b to the exponential negative s l over c and minus uh, l squared over s plus l squared over s minus 2c over s cubed that has to be zero Okay, and then from here, you have to find A and B, and they are going to be functions of S. Okay, they are going to be functions of S, so this one and this one going to go away from the top one. You can find A as a function of B, plug it into the bottom one, and uh, find then both of them, right? So from here, let's say um, A is equal to... 2 over c over s cubed, 2c over s cubed, minus b. And then plug this guy down into the bottom one. Where you will get 2c over s cubed, minus b, times exponential of s l over c, plus b exponential of negative s l over c and then uh, minus 2 c over s cubed is equal to zero and then you factor out the b term here correct or you can take them to the other side if you want and if you look these two terms are similar except for this exponential so if you do that and keep these two guys here 
this is going to be 2c over s cubed times exponential of s l over c minus 1. This is s, not pi. Is equal to b times uh, exponential of s l over c minus exponential of negative s l over c. And from here, you can find b directly as a function of s, then plug it back into uh, the top one and find a as a function of s. And then now your total function u of x and s is going to be completely found, right? So you have now a and b both as a function of s. And now that you got this, if you have that, now you have to apply Laplace inverse. Laplace inverse of u of x and t is going to be u of x, uh, x of s is going to be small u of x and t. Now, if you can find the inverse of those terms, which is not going to be trivial, then you can solve for it. So, for example, what's the uh, inverse of this? Well, you know, negative 1 over s means what? In time domain, it is... Um, since you are only applying it to, remember, the t term, not the x term, correct? So 1 over s is simply 1, right? So uh, let me just show you some of the inverses. So, for example, this one here, if I want to apply inverse of that, again, inverse is only applied to the s function, not to the x function. So this x can be treated as a constant. So this is going to be simply negative x squared. What about this? Again, treat L and x as constant 1 over s. Again, that's 1. So this is going to be Lx. What is this one? 1 over s cubed or 2 over s cubed. You know, that's uh, t squared, correct? t squared is 2 over s cubed. And you have a negative c. So this one is going to be negative c t squared. Those depend on the complexity because you have exponential terms and you have other terms too. So you have to simplify those terms. And if you do, it's not going to be that simple. Okay. You have to, uh, first of all, the exponential terms are going to be uh, delay terms, as you know, in the time domain. And uh, you have to simplify some of these. And uh, again, if you use delay terms and the rest of the terms, and you might need to do partial fraction even, then you should be able to find the solution. But clearly, solving this is not as trivial, okay? So as I said, it is doable and you can solve it, but you have to be good with Laplace transform, inverse Laplace transform, and then... Um, your uh, ODEs in general, but it is doable, but not easy, okay? So applying a Laplace transform will convert, as you saw, your PDE into what? Into an ODE, only in terms of X. The T is gone. The T converted to this algebraic parameter S which later use inverse and convert those S terms back into T terms. Okay, so this is an interesting way to approach these um, problems using Laplace transform, okay? So, there is only one method left, and that is using Fourier transform. And Fourier is similar, okay? The Fourier table is quite similar. The method is similar. Again, the goal here is to apply the Fourier transform to this function u. And Fourier will take your t variable into the algebraic variable w, or omega if you want to call it. So from the space of x and t, you go to the space of x and omega, where omega is the frequency. 
Here, you went from X and T to X and S. Again, S is kind of a frequency. But um, it's just the goal is to convert your PDE into an ODE. And then solve it. And then if you here apply inverse Laplace, it convert your S terms into T terms. Over there, if you apply inverse Fourier transform, it will convert your omega terms into T terms. So the nature of Fourier transform is a solution by Fourier transform is very similar to the Laplace transform. It's just using a different transform. All we are trying to do, as you can see in all of these uh, different approaches, is to go from a space that the solution is not possible or it is hard to solve, it's time consuming, it is cumbersome, to a different space where you can either solve it easier, like you convert your PD into OD, or something that you cannot separate into something that now you can separate and then try to solve it. Okay, so the nature of the solution is here the same. I just mentioned it. I'm not going to go through one complete problem like this one, but I just mention what can happen, okay? And again, if you are curious about these A terms and B terms, just go ahead and plug them in, right? Just go ahead and plug them in here. For, let's say, this B solution, you have to do some simplifications. It involves a bunch of exponentials. You have to try to simplify it as much as possible, right? And, uh, for example, before I get into Fourier, because I know some of you are curious, hey, okay, you left this uh, problem incomplete. I just want to show you what happens to B. So B is going to be 2C over S cubed times B to the S L over C minus 1 divided by E to the S L over C minus E to the negative S L over C. And what I will do here is uh, I can, for example, multiply everything by SL over C or factor out anything like that, for example, right? Or uh, just try to see if I can simplify anything here because I want to see if I can convert this whole thing into one exponential. Otherwise, this is not going to be super nice. Okay, you know, this is a sine hyperbolic and this is not a sine hyperbolic. So um, it's going to be one over sine hyperbolic, correct? Because this is like sine hyperbolic, you just need a two of um, uh, SL over C. And um, if you plug this guy B and multiply it by its own term, so that term that you had was B, if you look at that term, it was B exponential of negative S over CX. You have to then multiply that whole thing by that exponential. So it is going to be this whole thing times e to the negative sc over x. Okay, and if you can convert this whole thing into one exponential, then it is going to be a delayed version of the t squared function. If you cannot, then you have to use convolutions. Okay, you have to use convolutions. 
And that's where, in the convolutions, those integrals similar to those Fourier series would come. Because if you remember, Laplace inverse of f of s g of s is convolution of f of t and g of t, which is the integral from 0 to tau of f of t times g of t minus tau d tau. Okay, and calculation of that is also not necessarily simple. So this term is simple. Getting this one is simple. Inverse of that. Getting this one is simple. This one is not as simple. Because as I said here, in the denominator, you have a sine hyperbolic function. And then inverse of that is multiplied by these guys. So you have to see whether you have inverse sine hyperbolic anywhere. Do you have Laplace of 1 over sine hyperbolic? And there is functions. You can do that. It's not easy. Which you can see here. That's the sine hyperbolic function. If you have a 2, that's exactly sine hyperbolic of this guy. And then, again, that will be multiplied by this, which is going to be whatever the inverse of that is, a delayed version of it, and then the uh, whatever this one is, is going to be the second term. Okay, so it goes down to whether you can do this one, 1 over sine, or a cosecant hyperbolic, basically. If you can find that, then the solution is not going to be super bad but again it involves a lot of inverse laplace so you might say well i would rather go back and try these guys at least they look a little bit easier but again i'm just trying to remind you that uh solving pdes analytically is a very very hard task and now i know some of you might say well i did not find in any uh, laplace inverse transform table or laplace table the inverse of sine hyperbolic, forget about 1 over sine hyperbolic. That's right, you might not. And that's where you have to, for this function, you have to write it in uh, terms of its Taylor series or Maclaurin series. So if you write it in terms of Taylor series or Maclaurin series, then it is going to be a bunch of polynomials. And uh, you only need to use, uh, if you want approximate, a few terms, if you want accurate, a bunch of terms. But that's when you're going to get, again, polynomial terms and inverse polynomial terms. And those, you can take inverse Laplace. Okay, but it is going to convert it into an infinite series. And it is an infinite series. If you remember from my previous video, the solution to this wave problem was... An infinite series where it is, we call each one of those terms a, a mode shape. And we learned that the contribution of each one of the mode shapes is reducing by increasing the number of mode shape. So the first few mode shapes have big meaningful contributions, the rest of them are not. So if you follow this method, you can uh, easily show that you will end up with a similar solution, but again, uh, I just wanted to give you an idea and otherwise solving each one of these problems uh, like the wave problem or the heat problem through um, Laplace transform is going to take a good time. Okay, If you want to just get yourself rolling, try to apply to something much simpler. For example, something like ut right minus ux is equal zero just to start with first derivatives first apply laplace and use some simpler conditions and then if you want you can uh, go to harder levels but remember that it is involved and again i'm not going to do another example by fourier transform because it is rather time consuming the whole idea is this Fourier transform is similar in nature to what the Laplace transform does. So what you're doing, basically, you're taking a function from
from one domain to another. So uh, you can take your function from the time domain to the frequency domain, correct? And say that the uh, Fourier transform applied to some function like uh, g of t. It is the definition of, um, if you want, depending on how you define it, you might define it in terms of omega or um, f, let's say omega, since that's what I mentioned. So you can call this g of omega. And the definition of that is 1 over square root 2 pi, the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of g of t times exponential of negative i omega t dt. Okay, and if you even look at it, it's quite similar to the Laplace transform. And that's what I said, S in Laplace transform does represent frequency. So instead of going from U of X and T to U of X and S, which we did here, now here we go to U of X and Omega, where Omega is exactly the frequency. And again, this Fourier transform, like Laplace transform, it has linearity properties, it has a scaling properties, delayed, so on and so forth. If you want, you can just go ahead and look at the Fourier transform tables, which you can find easily, like on, for example, Wikipedia. But if you're not uh, so comfortable with this method, try not to go there. But you clearly see if you want to apply Fourier transform to the nth derivative of a function, the solution is going to be like i omega to the n times the uh, Fourier of that function, okay? So this i omega here acts very similar to s. Remember, it was s to the n, so that's similar. And convolution and so on and so forth, okay? So if you want, you can uh, go ahead and do this method, take it to the um, x and omega domain. So again, let me just write the overall of the thing. So you apply this u of x and t you apply Fourier to it and take it to u of x and omega. In this uh, space, your PDE is going to be converted to an ODE where you treat omega like a constant number. So if you can find this by solving that ODE, then you are going to apply Fourier inverse and get your solution, which is this guy that you need. Okay, so here you can solve it as ODE here. Solving it as PD is not as trivial. But the overall idea is the same. Okay, so I guess this video gone quite long. And I would stop it right here. In the next video, I'll show you um, how to solve these PDEs, which are not easy to solve analytically, how to solve them numerically using the finite difference method. And that method can solve any PDE, linear, nonlinear, it doesn't care. It has its own problem, convergence problem, and step size and everything, but we're going to talk about it in the next video. Thanks for your attention.